Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to our plenary session on health security and medical research. Um, my name's Jo Chandler. Uh, I'm a journalist and, and over the years I've written quite a lot of stories about um, health and disease and health security issues in various parts of the world and I'm assuming that's why I was invited to chair this <laughs> committee. Um, the other option is that I was once a health security risk and <laughs> did manage to import a certain bug that we'll probably be talking about to Melbourne from Papua New Guinea, but uh, can, you're all quite safe and I'm well thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yes, so in terms of um, health security, I, I probably have a different um, dimension that I may bring into the discussion at some point. Um, um, anyway, whatever the reason that I've been asked to do this, I'm very honoured to be comparing this session, which is going to be quite a loose interactive session. and. We'll have a bit of a chat up here and, and talk amongst ourselves, but then we'll probably invite you in pretty regularly as we go so that we can get a set of, uh, um, get a really engaging conversation going. Um, e each year the conference picks one sort of really live issue on the Australian aid program or in the international sphere and tries to dig right down into it to get some really um, in-depth analysis from the experts. And, and this year uh, the pick for that has been this uh, recent investment um, in the Indo-Pacific Health Security Initiative. Um, and the Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security, which was announced by the Foreign Minister last year uh, and is worth some $300 million over five years. Um, the angle that we're going to be exploring here in this session is really about the, you know, the health security and the medical research aspects of that. Um, but before we get cracking, I will mention that um, because there is so much interest and so many sort of um, angles to this. There was a parallel session held yesterday that was chaired by Helen Evans. I'm not sure, Helen, do you want to give a summary of that now or would you rather save it till we get to the Q&A? Um, well, I was thinking it might, it might be valuable now so we kind of know how far the conversation got yesterday for those who were in that session. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, thanks. You have to come out. <laughs> have to come out the front, Helen. Sorry, Claire. No. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Okay, thanks, Joe. We had a session yesterday, I know some of you were there, with the, the title health Regional Health Security, What is Australia's Role? It was a great discussion. We had a, a really good panel with different, different perspectives. We had... Um, someone from government, Robin, we had uh, Barbara McPake, who's an academic, but with a deep knowledge of, of health and health systems in developing countries. We had Nick Thompson, who heads up the Public Health and Security Centre at, at NOSL, and we had Amanda McClellan, who's with Red Cross and has done a huge amount of work in emergency areas, particularly with communities. So just to briefly, because I won't take up all your yes, time, sir. you know, we, we talked the... We, we talked around questions. The, we had three questions that we looked at. The first one we talked about is essentially what is health security? So what's the scope of it? And I guess the short answer was, well, how long is a piece of string? Um, we came to an agreement that, it, that it, at its core, you're looking at pandemics and epidemics, but it's broader than that. It's not just pandemics, and it's not just slow burn epidemics, which are incredibly important but it also needs to be um, focused within the broader health, health system. And I think there was a very strong, there's a temptation, Barbara said, there's a temptation that we, far, that we narrow down too, too narrow and say, oh yes, it's about strengthening surveillance, it's about strengthening laboratories. What we really need to do is map out the system, see what's working, what are the interactions, what's not working, and then decide what are the priorities for what we're doing. I mean, Robin was very clear that for the Indo-Pacific, you should correct me if I'm wrong, Robin, for the, for the Indo-Pacific um, Health Security Initiative, this isn't an expectation that Australia can or indeed should be taking on all the problems. It's about where can we add value working in partnership with the countries and also hopefully over time in partnership with other development partners such as CDC, etc. Um, so, okay, at its heart it's about security, it's about pandemics and epidemics, but it's broader than that, and then deciding where our focus is. Um, what's Australia's role? I've said that. I've just looked at my notes I made. Uh, a very strong agreement that we need to take a one health approach, so it's not just health, it's also about agriculture, fishing, trade, defence. Um, and we had a bit of a discussion about 
how that's essential because they're all linked together. But it's also a challenge. I mean, first of all, health is often quite a low priority within government settings, but also these areas don't naturally talk to each other. And the problem is the time they work best together is when there's a crisis and then that's too late. So how do we uh, facilitate an enabling environment where people actually, where those different areas all come together and work together? Um, Nick, who has the focus on public health and, and security, um, said, how do we balance security needs with public health needs? He made the point that many of the countries in this region uh, have very strong military presence, very strong security focus. We absolutely need to partner uh, with security forces and to make sure everybody sees that health and health security is, is everybody's business. And that's hard. We've done it. We did it in Australia with HIV, for instance, where we worked with police, with needle exchanges, etc. cetera. But, but that's a challenge we need to do. Um, and then a very strong focus from everybody, uh, but particularly Amanda, because of her experience with Ebola, et cetera, um, is the key role of communities. And communities, if they don't have a key role as just simply as recipients of risk messages, or most definitely not as, as the problem, but how do we engage them as, as equal partners? And that also led to a discussion about balancing human rights and privacy with the need for surveillance and data. Um, and we do a lot of that in academic research, ethics clearances, etc. But probably in terms of public health and government, often the use of surveillance and data is, is the privacy side of it gets pushed aside. Amanda talked about, you know, lists of Ebola patients that were just out in clinics and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then underpinning all of that is the need for trust to build relationships and trust. So that's a bit of a summary. Thanks very much. Sorry to turn that around. I thought it might be useful to begin with that sort of background rather than, than finish with it so mm. we know where the conversation got yesterday. Um, so, belatedly, I'll introduce our very distinguished panel. Um, so, first, we have uh, Blair Excel, Acting Deputy Secretary and Australia's Ambassador for Regional Health Security. And we have uh, Mary Moran, Executive Director of Policy Cures, a centre that monitors uh, global medical research and um, Brendan Crabb, Director and Chief Executive of the Burnett Institute in Melbourne and uh, one of Australia's leading health researchers and development practitioners. So thank you all for, for coming along. Um, so we'll kick off, Brendan, if I could kick off with you. Um, some people are critical of the very notion of, of health security, um, saying that it's going to distort priorities away from basic care um, and, and national needs. Um, I, I was in Papua New Guinea two weeks ago researching a couple of stories, and one of them was on malnutrition um, amongst children, which is sort of coming out of um, a report that was published late last year by Save the Children and Frontier Economics that found that um, I think almost half the kids under five in PNG are stunted from chronic malnutrition, mm -hmm. and that it's an underlying factor in something like 76% of deaths of kids. Um, so it's sort of wound in there as an underlying exacerbator cause and contributor, you know, with TB and, and malaria and other issues. Yeah. So I guess um, I'm interested when we're talking about poor nutrition being a factor in, in children's increased vulnerability to both catching and surviving disease. How, and, and, and you've got issues like hospitals um, running out of drugs, the lack of a health workforce of midwives. Um, to, you know, so something like this where we're focusing so much in a broader sense of health security how does that fit with these other sort of underlying conditions? And, and how do you make health secure in terms of disease um, um, surveillance and, and, and disease uh, uh, you know, responsiveness when you've got these other factors sort of you know, bubbling away and eroding your capacity from underneath? Well, the premise of the question is quite right. And I don't think you have trouble convincing anybody in this, uh, in, in this room about that. Um, but the pragmatic reality, and not just of this current health security initiative, both here and an interest in it around the world, or a disease-specific vertical program initiative that's driven so much of uh, our interests around the world, um, is that, that 
they're the hooks that, that generate interest, generally political interest, financing, and so on. You know, we have a global fund for HIV, TB, and malaria. We don't have a no, uh, you know, global fund for strengthening the health systems of the world's most vulnerable and poor people. We never will, sadly. Um, we don't have, you know, we have a global alliance for vaccines and immunisation. Again, another hook where the people really behind that, Helen's one of them, have the very same sentiment uh, at heart. So health security, if we, you know, is, if done correctly, if led well, as in this case, I can say, um, not just because he's sitting two away from me, but, <laughs> but uh, with Blair as the ambassador, Robin as driving uh, this health security initiative, the people well understand that, well understand that um, whatever specific choices there are underneath it, tuberculosis in the case of PNG, antimicrobial resistance, drug-resistant malaria, and greater Mekong and so on, um, those development paradigms, broader health system strengthening um, and, and building structures within the countries or the regions themselves are at the heart of a solution to those. So I think we need to embrace it. It is, it is just the, uh, uh, the reality of the world. Um, and if self-interest or disease-specific paradigms um, uh, drive funding, drive interest, and then the right people get involved, it could probably make more of a difference than, than trying to uh, tailor the, you know, the, the perfect system. In the case of PNG, I'll just finish with the, with the TB example because you know, that's one that is quite right. It is probably below... I think I'd put family planning at number one. I'd probably put nutrition and stunting at number two, but they are, they are just massive problems for, for that country <laughs> and they're symbolic of a very broken health system. Um, but TB is not irrelevant. It, in, sometimes these things in and of themselves, I have more of a malaria background than a TB background, but those diseases and HIV as well are actually single diseases that do shift the dial. So they, they do qualify to be to be targets of a, of a major um, uh, focus. So it's not a perfect world. I do agree with the premise of your question, but I just think we have to accept the model that's there and make it work as best we can for the broader principles um, and the broader development principles that we're, most of us are driven by. Well, I guess you know, there is this cyclical element mm. in something like TB. If your household head is sick for two years in treatment or, or has been you know, killed by the disease, then obviously then there's a cycle of poverty and nutrition there that's going to you know, sort of turn it, as well as exposure to disease. So maybe just to jump in there, I think yeah. you want us to jump in. So I was lucky enough to visit Daru um, Island last November, December, and, and to see what's uh, happening there in the hospital. Um, Burnett Institute is work, working there along with World Vision and the PNG Government Department of Health. And that was what, there was some bleak news in terms of uh, drug resistant TB and, and, and the rates of latent TB to much of the population. There's some great news in, in the um, treatment that's going on and the very high rates, in fact, world leading rates of treatment of drug resistant TB. But what became very clear was this compounding factors around the whole community, in fact, the whole district, mm. that was leading to the issues of why there was a large population that was living with TB. And so the complexity there of not just um, uh, infectious diseases in a health system, but in an even broader environment or ecosystem of development as well, that is, mm. is very, very real. And I guess, well, that, I guess, comes to the question that I was going to ask you about, which is, as, as, a, as a storyteller, often you, when you're dealing with a complex story, you sort of think, OK, well, I can really only pick out one piece of spaghetti and hope that some of the sauce sticks to it and that that will be <coughs> what I will deliver up and hopefully that will make sense to my audience. But so if you're looking here at this sort of mixture in Daru, for example, where you've got you know, population influxes of people coming from you know, across Western District because they, they need access to the money or because of the El Nino fallout from last year or you've got all these other disease issues going on, um, and they all play into health security mm. one way or another. So with, what's your mandate? How deep do you drill when you say, our, you know, with this initiative, we're here to tackle health security? <coughs> so how, how far can you drill down and how, and how wide can you sort of spread the net? So we do have, uh, I guess, some boundaries, if you like, for the health security initiative. You referred to the $300 million initiative. Robin may have talked a bit yesterday um, about what that looks like. Mm. But very broadly, there, there is um, an aspect of thinking of the regional global cooperation around health security that we're looking to work with DIRHO and a range of other par partners on. Um, there's, there's a focus on responding to the needs of countries and there's a lot of work going on 
um, uh, in uh, countries doing what we call the joint external evaluation, looking at the system, the capabilities, where are their weaknesses, and, and what, uh, what can we do to support those. There's a focus on bringing, and this came up yesterday, which we're seeing in the um, Shadow Foreign Minister's speech around bringing Australia's in institutional strengths, and we're really focused on that and thinking, and I'll talk later about the particular kind of research uh, call that, that we've put out. Um, and then the final component is accelerating access to new diagnostic and treatments. So that's kind of a boundary, if you like, for that <coughs> initiative. But certainly in, uh, for the government, it's in thinking how that supports our broader health investments in a place like Papua New Guinea, where there's other health um, uh, funding flow through the aid program, or Cambodia, or Timor Leste, um, and how we can sort of expand um, the work that we're doing and bring benefit to the broader health system. In fact, that was a conversation we had with the Deputy Secretary for the Department of Health uh, when I was there about how the TB program can actually not only go to multiple provinces, but then can work in, in, in the broader health system as well. Okay. Uh, Mary, can I ask you, um your perspective on this, I understand you, you know, you've done some blogs about this particular initiative where you've welcomed some aspects but had a but <laughs> attached to that. So if we could talk about the but and I guess then more broadly how that fit, you know, I think you've described Australia's global health effort as a mess and I'm wondering how this fits into the, into the wider sphere. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure, well just to clarify, I described our domestic R&D effort right. as a mess, not our global, not our global okay. um, So in terms of the initiative, um, I, I always get asked to be the troublemaker, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm going to say all the positive things first, because I think there are some. So uh, the first thing is, who can gripe about giving $300 million back to health that was cut? So it, it doesn't replace everything, but it's so welcome. <coughs> the other thing is, of course, uh, the details of about two-thirds of the funding aren't known. So the bit that's known is really the R&D bit, so I'm, I'm mostly talking about that. And. Uh, I think it's fantastic that we're investing in making new treatments for the region. So, for instance, um, a single-dose tablet for relapsing malaria instead of the current two-week treatment, or a 16-week all-oral cure for drug-resistant TB. Uh, the current treatment's nine to 18 months, injections, isolation in hospital, and tablets. So, you know, I think that's fantastic. Um, I think also putting some like relatively neglected diseases back on the map. You know, TB, you know that we talked about the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria. So TB kills more people than AIDS and malaria combined. And it got 16% of global fund disbursements because it's always been the poor relation. So I think putting drug-resistant diseases back on the map, like TB, is great. And now, now I'll do the bit I was asked to do, which is to be, <laughs> be a troublemaker. But there, there's, I think there are some downsides to the Health Security Fund. So mostly to the framing of it. So the f there's three things that really stand out for me. The first thing is when you get a new threat, like an emerging disease or a pandemic, you're meant to provide new funding. If you cut funding from existing health programs and give it to something new, you create a problem for yourself. So our, the issue is that effectively we've shifted health funding from diseases that we do have uh, to diseases that we don't have yet, although we may have them in the future. So that, that's always going to be a problem. You'll, you'll always get a lower health impact if you move funding from high burden existing diseases to preparing for diseases that you may have in the future. And um, one of the, um, I think one of the side effects is that some, that particularly happens for women and children's health, because you cannot squeeze pregnant women and children with diarrhoea into a health security framework even if you try. You can put in other things, but they, they will tend to lose out. Um, and that, I, probably that brings me to my other two points. I think DFAT staff have done an amazing job of trying to put as much normal health care into a health security framework as they can. Um, and I, I really thank them for that. Um, so we don't talk about malaria and TB now. We always call them drug-resistant malaria and drug-resistant TB. <laughs> and we don't, we don't train health staff anymore. We do epidemic preparedness and, and all of that. So I think that's a really good thing. But in the longer term, I, I think we could be shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit because we, we need to be able to be honest about aid. So what, do you know how many cases of drug-resistant TB we have in Australia a year? On average, 24. So what we say is uh, the Health Security Initiative is going to protect Australians from drug-resistant 
TB by turning off the tap in the region. Now, there's six million new cases of TB in the region every year. Well, it, it's not true. It's impossible to say that we will turn off the tap. We won't. But we have to say that because we can't say um, our aid program needs to fund these millions of people that are being consumed alive by a disease that we can treat with a course of antibiotics. Now, we can't say that anymore. We have to say, we are treating these millions of people because they're a risk to Australians. No, that's not actually true. And I think some honesty will help us in the long run. And I suppose that's my, my last point is, um, or my last kind of quibble. I, I, I think it's, um, it's helping, I think DFAT's inadvertently supporting that rather mean aid rhetoric <laughs> where we encouraged, you know, with a, we keep hearing whether it was 13th largest economy with 20 cents in every $100, all of that's true. But we're also being encouraged now not to spend that 22 cents on the needs of our neighbours, but increasingly to redirect it to ourselves, our health security, our aid for trade. So I, I, think, um, so I think it's a good thing, but I think these little uh, tricks that we're having to do to get the funding for things that, as you've all said, DFAT knows we need and wants to do and the region's asking for, but the politics means that we're having to brand and allocate aid based on political and media messaging. And I think that's a really slippery path to go down. I'm glad for the sake of the forum that you got over your inner Pollyanna who was wrong. Yeah, yesterday I did my Pollyanna thing. I'm very interested in that um, too because uh, certainly when I started doing some advocacy around TB um, after my drug resistant TB, after my diagnosis, and tried to think about, well, how do I turn this into a story about this crisis on our doorstep? I thought very carefully about the messaging and I very deliberately framed all of the pieces that I wrote and the presentations that I was invited to do around saying, this is a crisis and emergency now for these people at this time, rather than saying, you need to worry that. Um, on holiday or I might fly in next door and bring this home and it's mm. going to be a problem for you in the future. And that was a, a really deliberate um, tactic of mine, even though I knew, being a media player, that I'd probably have a lot more purchase and traction if I had hit the alarm button and mm. said, it's, you know, it's about, imagine if I brought this home and I'd been contagious, which by a bit of luck I wasn't. So, um, so I'm very interested, and that was one of the questions I was going to do, how do you, how do you frame this messaging with, without it looking like we're sort of going to throw the switch to the invisible force field that will, you know, cut us off from the next pandemic. So I'm very happy to be very clear for Mary and others. The Australian <laughs> government is very happy that it's able to help the millions of people with TB or malaria, and that is the purpose of the aid program. Mm. And we're also able to say, and that for those that think more in this frame, is of direct benefit to, to Australia. And I guess I'm, I'm in, really encouraged, and if those that want to see what I've said written backed up in formal government policy, just read the white paper. Uh, which is almost the highest articulation. There's a very clear statement there that talks about the Australian Aid Programme being representation of Australia's values. Um, it says that very clearly. Also then goes on to say mm -hmm. that actually it also represents an investment in the region, helps the region, and that indeed then in turn helps, helps Australia. So I think we can be very clear. Um, there's no doubt I think sometimes in some audiences you may put a different weighting on some of those, but that's natural and that's a message that people do in many situations according to the audiences they're talking through. Mm -hmm. But I think the government, the policy documents are very clear that we do it for both. Um, yeah. Does that help, Mary? Look, in, <laughs> in, in, the, the reality is... <laughs> the reality is the Australian community, in the main, the Australian community don't support the aid program. Um, they're not entirely comfortable with it. I don't believe they want an increase. I think they have... Uh, most likely a distorted perception of how much they give, all of those sorts of things. Um, our uh, political masters uh, listen to that. So I think that's the reality. Turning that around has to be an aim for us. We have to think of new ways uh, of doing that. I can say that more than you can, Blair, from where you, where you sit, but um, you know, we have to find different ways. Interesting discussion. You mentioned the military already. I happen to think that we need military as advocates for aid, for example, such as happened in the US recently to protect the US aid budget. Um, whatever the method might be, it's probably a longer term 
thing for us to really turn that paradigm around uh, in Australia. In the meantime, we have to use what we've got as best we can um, and fight really hard for the funds that are there, such as in the Health Security Fund, to be used for the biggest impact in the uh, broader spirit of, of uh, uh, you know, in a broader development context spirit than just the, the uh, very self-interested protect Australia's border and uh, or deal with a specific disease. I think that sentiment is there, even though, as Blair said, there are boundaries around what the Health Security Fund can be used for. Um, but it's just, just the real world for us. It's the real world um, for a while yet, I suspect. Uh, and so, so a two-pronged attack of living with what we've got, doing the best we can with it, while um, a really completely different and bold attitude to changing the psyche of Australians and therefore Australian politicians around the benefit of aid. So I probably contest a little that I think the overall view, and Stephen Lena could probably answer this much better from the survey that Dev Pobbs does, but I'd probably contest that the most Australians are against. There's definitely a nuancing of views around, in fact, we were just talk, talking about this, around whether it's in the national interest, whether it's done effectively and done well, um, and these are factors that matter to people when, when they hear about the, the aid pro program. But it's undeniable um, that health security, and indeed if you think of Zika, um, Ebola and ZARS, absolutely triggered um, uh, a pretty broad Australian response. And I think if one of, one of the actual other things I was, I was very interested about a year ago when the government announced an initial contribution to the NPolio campaign, that actually got one of the biggest kind of positive reactions we've had for a number of years last year. So I think there is uh, a, an appetite, particularly for health, I love all other sectors as well, um, but the messaging around health actually resonates with people and in individuals much more clearly, and we see that in kind of um, surveys and testing that we do as well. So I, I agree, we, think we need to use this to kind of broadly message to around Australia. But, but the fact of the matter is you can cut billions, as many billions as you like from the aid program and the Australian public won't bat an eyelid. Oh. Can I how, say how much is that about, I guess, our last session here? It's happened. It? Well, it, yes, it has happened. Um, and a big part of that, I guess, is the vanishing of the aid and development uh, agenda from mainstream media as well, because there's, you, you mm. don't have, you know, that storytelling is there, so a kind of a familiarity with how aid works, how it doesn't work, what it achieves, ultimately what's in it for you in a more sophisticated way, those narratives have gone. So I guess we've got this, again, mm. another self-perpetuating cycle. Um, we do. I also, uh, to, uh, to some degree, I'm not sure that's true, that Australians don't support it. Five years ago, there was bipartisan support for the aid program, twice the level it is, not twice the level it is now, but certainly aiming towards 0.5%, yes. where now it's just over 02 Never heard a peep about it, Australian community perfectly happy. So some of it, I think, is about, we're not on top of our messaging, that the three-minute gal that talked about... Um, uh, you know, we need to be clear on our message and honestly, a 20 cent piece, hold up and say, that's all we're spending every hundred dollars. Most people are like, you're kidding me. And, and they, they're really keen on the idea that of hospitals and healthcare and watching women deliver and helping all that stuff. It's just, we, we don't message properly. We all fight with each other, we compete for funds. It should be this, it should be that. You know, in some ways we're our own worst enemies and I'm part of that group of people going out there with competing ideas. But the other thing is I think, A very prominent UK bureaucrat said, it's our job to speak truth to power. And I think that is our, is our job. So when the government says, we'd like to cut this, it is our job to say, if you want health security, you have to provide more money. Otherwise, I will have to, these women, these children are at risk, these programs are at risk. Um, and, and make that much harder for them. And I know we say they're our political masters, but it used to be the case, when the civil service in the UK still is to a degree, that your job was to say to government, we understand what you want to do, but it's not, it can't work like that. And so I think we've stopped doing that a little bit. It's a bit the public service has become politicised through no fault of their own. I was a public servant, I know what it's like when you're inside. But I, I think we've gone so far down that path that someone can say we're going to cut all health funding and set up a health security fund and we all just go, oh, excellent, let's implement that. And that's not really... I mean, we, we've implement, we're just implementing it. We're not saying, well, that represents this many women and this many children and this many whatevers. So I'm not, I'm not blaming the department. I'm just saying the whole, yeah. the whole um, 
as a community, we've been quite weak and divided, I think. And I think partly we've swallowed this government story that no one cares about aid. I reckon it's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I was just going to come back on an element of that. Um, <laughs> sorry, which element of that? Um, and it's something that someone else wrote, who shall remain nameless, that there was no strategy behind the connection, uh, if, if you like, of our health programming. There's no question that the health, um, and you know the numbers, the overall health funding has declined um, through the aid budget. Um, but I, I guess I just remind some people that another really important principle we've discussed in many other forums is country context. And when we allocate funds at a country level through country programs, that is actually a discussion process, a, a negotiation sometimes, but certainly something we look to discuss with partner governments. So in many, in many countries, you've seen a changing in profile from some of those countries themselves. That's not an unstrategic, um, unconnected com conversation that happens without us being aware of it. We're very aware of it. Um, but I just wanted to remind the audience that actually that's not something that Canberra, if you like, or DFAT sits here and says we're turning off the health in, in Vietnam or we're turning off. That's actually a discussion with a partner government that has its own set of priorities, its own development plans. And most of you in different guises having pushed DFAT harder to say give more profile to that. So we do look at those numbers and then we do think about well, what, what does that mean? What are the risks? What are the issues? Um, and so rather than being an uh, unconnected and sort of unstrategic, you could say those things go hand in hand and actually be quite a joined up approach to those pressures and what's happening in countries. Um, I've got some question or question about the, the research agenda, but, but while we're on this sort of lively argy-bargy, I think I'll throw it <laughs> open best. and see, and see <laughs> where it goes. Stephen wanted, where so Stephen is. Anybody on the floor want to join in to this sort of thread of the discussion? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, when, um, while you're thinking of it, when the, the coalition government, you know, firstly, Labor announced they weren't committing to 0.5% of GNI, and then the coalition really did the damage, and they came in. The comment wasn't about we don't like aid, but it was about aid's for the good times. We, don't, we can't concentrate on that now. Things are tough, um, and, and we've got interests at home that have to be taken care of first. That was the justification largely for it, and, um, you know, so, I, I mean, I do agree. It's, it's not fair to say... Australians don't um, uh, respect aid at all, but they don't rank it compared to those. You know, that, that message resonated. It's true. Let's get rich again, and then we can do it, uh, was effectively the message there. But I guess I'm a bit Pollyanna myself about the appetite or the interest of, of readership in these stories. When, they're done, when the messaging is, as Mary talked about, when it's sort of thoughtful and clear and evocative and often you know, really intimate, deep storytelling, you do get a receptiveness. And, and I feel like I've had this argument a million times with editors who say people aren't interested in TB, malaria stories. And I say, well, isn't that in the telling? And when we do present a powerful, intimate story that's deeply researched with beautiful, strong images and we can actually bring the characters, the, the narrative to life, it's like the pictures that we many of us would have seen the other night um, the, the exhibition that opened this forum um, and listening to Nick talk about those pictures, I mean, every picture was a story of an individual. It wasn't a story of a statistic in the middle of a landscape. And, and, and every one of those stories was, I think, so powerful because he talked about going back to that person 10 years, five years down the track um, and talking about their disease or their, their, their challenge within the context of their their income, their household, their, their, you know, their transport options. So suddenly you get this three-dimensional reality that which as a reader and a, and a, and a citizen and a, you know, a human, I can connect to. Mm. And if aid stories are full of those characters, I would argue that you would get um, a lot more engagement and interest. But maybe, you know, I have lost that argument many times in newsrooms. <laughs> um, but I have noticed on the times when I've been able to persuade editors to really back a story, like really... We, you know, we ran really strong images around Daru and the TB epidemic in the early days and got a massive response from readership to that when it was portrayed really strongly and we kind of made that judgment and pushed it hard. But a lot of the time when we get those stories, we'll hide them behind, you know, the football and the bachelor. So um, they, they get lost in the agenda. Do you no, know they are great it, stories. Sorry. I was going to say, you know what MSF did to get attention in the UK? They got famous actors. They took them off to Africa. So Daniel Day-Lewis, yay, 
went off to um, and looked at uh, sleep, sleeping sickness treatment centres. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how much money they raised so quickly and they got so much attention. So they had just had a series of good-looking, famous folk, <laughs> celebrities, <laughs> who, who they shipped off to, to places they cared about. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it, honestly, people do respond. I think they do. But it's not as simple as that. But no, it isn't. We're, we're the, stories, the stories can be told. I Not long ago went to... Um, you know, they can be told at a national level too, uh, to, to Bangladesh, because I was interested in their success story as a nation. Fertility rate of 6.7 not too many years ago, 2.5 now. What's the story um, with their development? It turns out that, it, you know, uh, and they're one of Australia's most emerging trading partners. Mm -hmm. You know, Australian aid was an important factor, a very important factor in that, in that um, last 30 year history in their, in their development. And there's a, you know, there's good story, lots of good story behind that. I don't think any Australians would have a clue about that. Mm. Well, we're probably getting a little off track. So yes. uh, there is a question I'm seeing up the back. Thanks very much, John Langmore from the University of Melbourne. The Ebola, the Ebola gift was mentioned. Uh, Australia, of course, uh, was about a year late with that, and uh, was was strongly criticised around the UN for its for its absence from any significant reaction, and it was a, a very uh, strangely uh, structured reaction, uh, which was much criticised by NGOs when it, when it was finally made. It, 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 it's not a particularly good example of, of Australian aid being well used. That's a leading question, if I've got it. Um, yeah, thanks, John. I was pretty closely involved with that, as you prob probably know, working co-chairing with the Department of Health, if you like, a, the um, certainly public service res um, support to the government to respond. I I'd actually probably disagree with the what you're talking about, strong UN criticism. Um, Australia responded pretty quickly and, and quite and very generously. Um, with contributions to a range of mechanisms through through the UN, we also uh, supported a range of Australian or NGOs who, with Australian NGOs with um, uh, affiliations and, and representation in West Africa at that time, um, and then uh, there was actually a series of really intricate and delicate delicate is the wrong word almost argy bargy at times. Um, discussions that needed to happen to support a presence for uh, Australian support to West Africa at that time. Um, and there was a lot of conversation happening around the world about how to manage the risks for um, people working and serving in West Africa should they catch Ebola. Um, and that, and that, a lot of that r remains b behind, I guess, doors and, pro and, and, and should. But let me just assure you, it wasn't an easy process to work through those issues for how Australia could, could support. I was actually very proud of then at uh, the end, um, and I don't think we were a year late, we are certainly later than others, um, but that's a bit consistent with our overall approach to working with other donors in Africa versus the Pacific. It's the Pacific, we're absolutely front and centre, and you're seeing that right right now with the um, Cyclone Gita that's happening. In Africa and other parts of the world, other partners who have the lead respond more quickly, and then we do what we can to support. But I think our, our response was actually very good, it was very effective, there were, there were parts of it that have actually gone on to be used as models elsewhere. Let me stop there. Just um, any other questions? Oh, okay. Right. Ian Anderson, I'm an independent consultant. I'd like to talk about the financial sustainability of all this work. So I travelled a bit around the PNG and the Pacific. And people say it very nicely, but the basic line I get to hear from Pacific Islanders is, how sustainable will this be from the Australian government? You know, they say to, to me and others, we used to have those health knowledge hubs, we got a lot of value out of them, and then they were closed. And we had the 40% cuts to the, uh, to the health sector, very little consultation. Why should we trust Australian government? Now, they don't say it quite as crudely as that, but boy, that's what they're thinking. That's another one for you, Blair. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah, I just... I Sorry, um, perhaps I could ask a question. Um, kia ora ana koutou. my name is Evelyn Masters. I'm from the New Zealand Institute of Pacific Research and the question very nicely dovetails into yours. Um, one thing that I would like to hear a little bit more about is we've been talking a lot about how, 
health security messages can have positive effects, but they can also have very negative effects. Um, if we use TB as an example, um, sometimes this can increase stigma. And so I'd like to sort of talk a little bit more about the relationship between this idea of health security, um, stigma, migration quotas, and um, possibly xenophobia. And so you, you, can, you can enter that at any angle you like, but perhaps, <laughs> perhaps um, the Manus Island example could be a good one to start with. <laughs> so I'm personally not going to go near the Manus Island one. I do think that's a stretch too far for the conversation I think we're meant to be having. Yeah, yeah, um, I'm happy to take on a little bit the sustainability question. It's an absolutely valid question that not only applies to health security, in fact, across the board, so it is something we, we do need to, to think about it. I'd in part answer that by coming back to conversations we've had around the health systems. Um, I'm really, really proud, really pleased, and this was the, you know, we did a lot of consultations leading into the, the initiative, um, and Brendan touched on it right, right at the start, about thinking of that interaction and um, overlap, and some of you may maybe heard me talk about, you know, ideally we want to see the sweet spot between health systems and health security, and the research that, we, that the minister announced in October last year um, is, is absolutely aimed at thinking how do we get the best overlap between these issues? How, do we, how can we target our support? Um, Mary talked about the, the research aspect of our funding that's mostly been announced so far. There may be room for more later. We're leaving some, some space there. Um, but the country level support to countries, we want to kind of do the best we can to get the, the, the best advantage of both of those dimensions. So that's, you know, that's, again, drawing on Australia's expertise. There are fantastic organisations and entities and individuals who are really good in, the, in this space in Australia that want to kind of draw on for the advice about how we can ta ta tackle that issue. Um, the broader question around trust, you know, I, I think there is great trust between many Pacific countries in Australia, and I don't think that's been damaged. That's something we have to continue to work out. It takes hits and goes up and down at different times. Um, but equally, the step up, I think, was a really important announcement that the government made I'm going now beyond health into labour, middle, and a range of other, other issues for me is part of that conversation we're having. I think is moving in a really good direction across the Pacific. And that question of, about stigma, though, too, I mean, and, and, and security, and so obviously, how, how do you manage an alert and awareness and, and to be sort of flagging issues without at the same time, you know, really you know, loading up a particular portion of these populations with this terrible burden of stigma? Oh, look, I'm not sure I can speak with great authority on it, except to say that those um, in Australia who I know work closely on either regional HIV in the past and present still, and, and definitely presently on, on TB, are very conscious of that. Um, the stigma that is a major barrier at an individual and community level is also, in the case of TB, it's a barrier at a national level. It's national, um, uh, it can be perceived as a national embarrassment. For example, I sometimes perceive, and so very tricky issue. Um, uh, TB and of course HIV was in in the past, and the answer is not rocket science to this audience. You know, it's it's working at a community level with that as a major uh, focus and objective, not just expecting that because you have a clinic and because you have drugs and because you have good physicians and trained nurses, it's going to work. Um, there are other barriers, and, and I say that's not that's not news to this group. And the big one for, uh, in PNG, if we take that, keep going with that as example for HIV and for TB is stigma. Um, and you know, just yesterday, one of uh, our colleagues working in Daru told me the story of a woman who wasn't responding to treatment. And uh, anyway, the short story was she was squirreling away her drugs Two months she'd squirrel, she had MDR TB, she was squirreling away her drugs, which you take literally a handful of drugs every day, as you know, for MDR TB. Um, and she'd been doing it for two months. And she, because she was so embarrassed and stigmatised to have TB, she wanted to die. That's what she ended up t telling um, our staff, and that got told yesterday. So they were embarrassed that they didn't have a structure around to identify that uh, early enough. Um, huge, huge uh, issue that um, has been the cornerstone, I think, of why we've seen some success in PNG in the case of HIV and, and the TB programs heavily dependent on, um, on addressing it. 
we need to talk about the research components soon, but, but do we want to take one more question for now while we're in this thread? Yeah. Sita Giri, uh, UNDP Recovery Advisor uh, with UNDP in Nepal. Um, I would like to uh, refer to the statement that was made in the very beginning of this presentation. Investment in health security is it a distraction for, from basic health care. It's not either or, both are needed and mutually supportive. I was in Sierra Leone when the Ebola crisis uh, was happening and it was very clear, very, very clear that the pro uh, problem was exacerbated because of the very weak health system, especially in Guinea and also Sierra Leone. So around uh, January, February in Liberia, uh, the Ebola was kind of uh, brought down to zero, but it would not be contained in the region in because it kept popping up in Sierra Leone as well as in Guinea. So um, while of course uh, there is resource constraint, but it's not either or, uh, both need to be uh, looked at. And uh, the Ebola recovery strategy, one of the key elements there was improving the health system in the region. Thank you. Well, that's beautifully said. And, and my, this kind of my, um, trying to be my point in that with the health, through the health security initiative that's there, and, other aspects of the aid program, um, uh, people involved are well aware of, of that, that uh, health security, whether you're talking about it, acute emergencies or the more slow burn ones, health, uh, health systems is at the core of that. And uh, so if that can be used as a, as a, as a way to, um, uh, to, to strengthen the health system and, and float a lot of boats as a result, then it's all good. And I, and I think that's exactly what's happening. Well, I guess as an outsider, when you're looking at this question, you know, so managing a health crisis, a security crisis like an Ebola, and then at what point, does the, how deep does the security network go? And, and I'm just recalling um, talking in, in, in Lagos and then listening to a um, uh, the head of CDC gave a, um, a speech a year or two ago, sort of recalling how it was the polio infrastructure on the ground that quashed what could have been a disastrous outbreak in yeah. Lagos, and, and this thing could have gone off. And initially, the, the, the first uh, effort to try and um, contain this, were, he said, were disastrous. And then someone had the bright idea of using the networks on the ground of the polio teams, and the contact tracing, and the infrastructure, and the human resource, and they got it, and they nailed it. And mm. so sort of looking at that as an outsider, I'm sort of saying, well, so is health security top down or bottom up? And, and how does it work unless you have that infrastructure on the ground? Well, I actually think the inclusion of R&D in the health security thing is fantastic because uh, people always talk about health systems and, R and investment in R&D, like new drugs and vaccines, as if they're competing. But, but systems need, need to have products to give the people they treat, and products need systems to be delivered. And so a lot of people don't know we've got an Ebola vaccine now. Did you know that? It sort of dropped out of the news. So in the last trials, 90% effective. We won't know fully un unless there's an outbreak, which we hope there won't be. But we hear a lot about Ebola, but then when people invest in R&D, that, that, those health systems now have a vaccine that can be given out. And I mean, that's a, a huge breakthrough, but I, I'm just trying to get us back onto R&D. Yeah, yeah, well, this is my area. Beautiful statement. <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe I just comment on broadly. I, I agree that the use of the polio um, uh, workforce was fantastic and a great opportunity. I know that uh, the challenge for us is, of course, where you don't have that. Mm. Um, what works? I think the DRC um, an example, again, was very positive. I'm not exactly sure how much they had. I don't think they had the same sort of polio numbers or workforce they had. Um, there, but uh, I guess the learnings from the West Africa experience, the um, positive progress, I think it's anyway, it's perfect, um, but the World Health Organization's Health Emergency Program, uh, it's great to have an Australian, P Peter Salama, there, uh, um, heading up that. I think is also um, making progress on being able to, and this is probably John, the point that John was also making, the globe was slow to recognise that, I think that's that's improved, improved a lot. There's a much greater monitoring system. There's there's different lines of communication about reporting outbreaks and how, how that works. So I think we're better positioned. I think we've still yet to test what happens when there's a big outbreak and you may not have that standing army. Um, or we still have some of the same health systems uh, challenges in many parts of the world where the diseases are likely to occur. Mm. I'm also recalling, I think there was an article in The Lancet um, last year or the year before about the TB response in Papua New Guinea that caused a bit of a stir um, from the, the pharma group. Um, 
I think, and, and basically saying there is a way we can fix this. We've done it before with massive resources um, elsewhere in, in the Pacific. I'm trying to remember the name of the location. Um, Chub Island? Uh, anyway, they, there was a blueprint mm. in an American area of Mark how they mm. kind of, yeah, dropped in there and threw massive resources at, at, at um, sort of you know, quashing this um, drug resistant outbreak, but huge, huge investment. But this was sort of floated as the response that needed to roll out in Papua New Guinea, and there was incredible resistance, I think, nationally and, and from the Australian government as well. I'm just wondering if anybody wants to wants to, in, to sort of talk about that sort of a... I mean, that was a health security challenge, and it was a health security model that was supposed to have been proved and, and was argued in this article to have worked, and yet it wasn't one that was seen to be palatable in our political context at that yeah, time. Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that, mm. if you like. I mean, I... I think that the it's another case of perhaps the messaging not being as fulsome. You know, um, fact of the matter in PNG is you have two things going on. You have a national um, TB uh, problem that is deeply penetrant in all the provinces and the vast majority of the eight million people. Um, but you also have a, a, what some would call an emergency, but definitely an, a, an unusual crisis in two, maybe three hotspots. And that's what they're referring to, the response in those hotspots, which was never going to fix what was happening um, in, the, in the whole of the country. Much bigger, long-term problem. But those hotspots of the spread of MDRTB, mostly in Daru and in the Western Province, a little bit in Gulf and now in, the, in Port Moresby in the National Capital District, was what was being referred to. Can we just worry about this health system stuff later and get in there and quash it, I think was the argument. Um, and of course, wasn't a particularly well told story. Yeah, I, I was just going to comment. I think we do come back to the sustainability question. I was struck on my recent visit by there are actually, and I wouldn't, there are significant resources supporting uh, Daru um, and those hotspots. Um, and there is a question how long that can go. In fact, I know many of you, may, or some of you may, may have worked on, I'm trying to think, is it 80 million per annum? Approximately, I'll get, don't quote me on that figure. Um, the question is, how long can, will that go? Um, how long can we keep, keep that up? I know we're trying to think now about what happens next and where to, and how that get broadened out through the PNG system. Um, is is John Godwin here? I'm only asking because I want to raise a question that he raised in the development policy blog was yesterday about the the research component. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, um, so trying to get back onto the research question. Um, so he he ran a piece on your most excellent blog, Stephen, um, questioning, um, in particular, I think, sort of where were the vaccines? Uh, I think his question was that looking at in, in the sort of the fine print of this initiative, that there's talk about putting some of the 75 million into new drugs um, and into new diagnostics, um, and that there is a mention of vaccines, but the way his analysis indicated that that was um, going to be geared to sort of new outbreaks and Zika risk issues rather than um, um, old foes like TB and malaria. Um, so he was really raising that question about this, does this pot of money give, you know, why is it not paying attention to vaccines? And is that the case or has he misread that? So, may, so maybe just two parts to that, um, just on TB and Valeria, as, as Mary and Brendan have both said, so we are coming, we're using a broader definition than classic health security, and I think that's the kind of reinforced the, the, um, uh, the forum or, or the session yesterday. So the drug-resistant aspects of old foes is really what we're kind of using to expand that in, in the emerging infectious disease space. So we definitely are looking at uh, malaria and t t TB. We are absolutely, though, emphasising more the late-stage product development. So um, there's, there's an another... PDP call for research for 75 million. That is more at the end of the spectrum than up front. We think that's um, a, a better bet in terms of the risk um, and, and the cost and the, and the funds that we have at the moment available. We're very proud that this is the largest quantum or the, the largest um, investment in health and med medical research the Australian government has ever made in, in through, through the aid program. So if we look carefully at that balance, we think that's that's the best place to land. We actually did, I think we um, we put it out publicly. There was an independent kind of evaluation that we had that, to give us some advice. So we took that that on board. Um, we are looking at that issue of vaccines. So I know the broader Department of Health has done some support, small, but still some there to CEPI 
Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, um, which is looking at more of the vaccines in, in, in your um, uh, in infectious diseases. And then also we're looking at that as well from the health security initiative to see if we can sort of support that as well. So that's probably at this stage the angle that we're taking on, on vaccines. Ashley, can we chip in here? Yes, um, John will kill me, but I, I think I, at this point, I don't think DFAT should be investing in TB or AIDS vaccine research. And the reason I say that is the basic science isn't there yet. So ERAS was set up to do trials of TB vaccines, and they have done a number, but they have all failed, as have many of the AIDS vaccine trials. And there's been a real... Uh, really difficult period of thinking where people have said, look, we need to, we've been rushing in, we don't know what we're doing, we need to go upstream and get some of this science sorted and then trial more promising leads. So the Gates Foundation has set up a medical research institute that said, we're going to start working with, with companies and with researchers and try and get a real ferment of activity in these leads. Now that is where I think Australia should then come in, because when those leads come out, and they will from CEPI, which is looking at... Um, like platforms for vaccine development, and we should be supporting that, I think, because that's, that's where we need to focus. So when the Gates Institute and CEPI and others have generated these leads, then what's going to happen? We're all going to be sitting here at this conference in a few years' time going, oh, God, we need a billion-dollar initiative to trial these things. Globally, we need to get together and put in this big pool of money to run... You know, a vaccine trial, the malaria vaccine trial, 17,000 children in seven countries over years. Cost an absolute fortune. These are hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And I see Helen nodding because she knows that, you know, she had to, if you're involved in Garvey, you know how long it takes and how much it costs. So I, I reckon they've made the right decision. And as I said, John will slaughter me tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but there's a place for vaccine development when we've got some vaccine leads that look worth developing. And I think DFAT, I was talking to Robin about this too, I think we should be planning ahead because when they come out, you know, let's not be sitting here again going, oh, you know, where should we get the money and we've got the aid budget and like, why, why, why? I think Australia should take the lead. Gates wants to do this and say, we have enormous clinical development capacity. Clinical trials are a real strength in Australia. Clinical knowledge links with the region. We'd like to work with you to start setting up the, the nub of this clinical development group that we are going to need in the future and let's get it ready now it takes years to get those mm. kind of things organized so so I, I i wouldn't be pushing for more money on vaccines right now so you're happy with the fine print or the, the, yeah well the i think uh, no well yes and no <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, because you can't do it in health security but can i give you an example of product that we can't support so defat supporting uh, tb and malaria drugs diagnostics possibly vet to control all of which is great but, as I said, reproductive health, you can't squeak into a health security framework. So, over 100,000 women bleed to death in childbirth every year. Um, the reason is that the treatment has to be rejected, uh, injected and refrigerated. So, if you don't have power, fridge and nurse, you can't have it. So, Monash University developed a powdered form of the oxytocin. And GlaxoSmithKline, which is one of the world's biggest multinational drug companies, said, we'll adapt our asthma puffer to give the correct dose of the oxytocin and we'll make it for 30 to 50 cents. Um, it was voted as one of the 30 innovations worldwide likely to save the most lives. They estimate at least 140,000 women. And then, of course, their infants, because babies do terribly if their mother dies. But, but we can't fund it here in Australia. And that's why I described our domestic global health funding as a mess for R&D. Do you know the reason we can't fund it? Because there's no depart... So, for instance, MRC funds uh, research, early research into oxytocin, but not development. Um, DFAT funds development, but not for women's health. Um, you know, Department of Defence, no, Department of Industry will fund development and women's health issues, but only if they're commercial. Department of Defence will fund development, but not, not for developing world, like for women's health, for developing world diseases. So in Australia, there are seven agencies that fund global health R&D on and off. They don't coordinate, they operate in silos. Sometimes they actually fund the same organisation without even speaking to each other. Um, they, there's, 
And because they, they, there's lots of duplication and there's a big gap, which is the development of products. So if we have spent now in Australia, we've invested over a third of a billion dollars in the last 10 years into global health research. That's six, over 650 projects. Guess how many of those we funded for development? That means even the first test, like in a mouse. Okay, 13. So, 13. And of those, 11 were funded from an Austrade program that's shut after a year. So there's actually no one in Australia now that funds development of global health research. So we've got this mountain of global health research. We checked it two years ago. It was 280 million invested and 600 projects. Now, two years later, that's gone up to 350 million and 650 projects, and we still haven't put a cent towards translation. So that's why you can't do oxytocin, mm. because th no one does that. Bren Brendan. Uh, Isn't that insane, though? I should, I should, sorry, but I should show you the little puffer. We've actually got the little puffer, but we can't trial it because there's no one that funds it. With, with your NHMRC hat on, I guess, just reflecting on some of the things that Mary said then, and these sort of this patchwork and the gaps and where there are opportunities. And I, and I think, Stephen and Camilla, in your analysis that you said that we know that, what was it, global, global medical researchers' access um, is valuable and should be expanded, but then you were also proposing maybe another pot of money outside DFAT and outside Australian aid to fund exactly this sort of thing? Am I...? So, so um, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, and and so, so, so the good news, I think the unexpected good news, especially perhaps to the development audience, is that um, the NHMRC and the Department of Health does, in fact, fund so much of this stuff, inhalable oxytocin. Um, malaria is a, is a powerhouse area of research in Australia, one of the world's leading um, centres that's largely NHMRC funded. Um, so at that discovery end, which you've Research. admitted is, 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 is good, so we come up with, um, with uh, both the knowledge and, and the early, very early stage product ideas. Um, and there's some good news there. You know, the NHMRC type funding is doubling uh, through this new medical research future fund. It's not um, going through the NHMRC, but it is going through the health minister, and it's supposed to have a translational um, bent to it. We'll, it's just had its first small disbursement last year, but it's ramping up quickly. It's supposed to build to a $20 billion fund. I think there's $8.7 or $8.9 million billion dollars in the fund already. So it's a very real increase in pool in that area. And I think that the challenge is to find ways, as Mary suggested, to get those, to fill the gaps. I think there are two significant gaps. One is, is the one that um, uh, you mentioned, uh, early stage, especially commercialisation and perhaps um, pooling resources for later stage. And the second is operational type research. I don't think we do much operational research directly tagged to our development activities. Um, uh, for, for example, in, in the TB response uh, in, in PNG, you know, we know that, uh, that uh, uh, we can accelerate the pace of the decline through operational research, through better use of the tools that are there already. Um, taking into, not just through the tools, but of knowledge, of dealing with issues such as stigma at a community <laughs> level. Um, what are the best ways to do that? There's no rule book. Uh, you, you know, you've got some guidelines, but there's no rule book for community X or community Y you need to do uh, the operational research. So there's a couple of gaps. And then there's tremendous opportunities to synergize. And the really great news story about the aid um, uh, paradigm in Australia, we've talked about the, the negative. The great news story, and the Health Security Fund is a beacon of that, is that we can now talk about research in health in the aid context in a much freer way um, than we could uh, before. There's a really emerging a very strong appreciation, not yet exactly knowing how to apply it um, in a way that is a truly development, um, in a development context. But uh, having the conversation, now there's a funding mechanism and perhaps the most powerful um, use of the Health Security Fund is, is as a leveraging tool to do the sorts of things that um, uh, Mary suggested. At least our own government's expenditure, broadly speaking, in this health, in this area, to be coordinated um, in some way, shape or form. And it's why I like the, the, uh, you know, the, 
something like the agriculture model in, uh, uh, through, through DFAT uh, for health, but especially if our own health department embraces that and, and uh, is happy to have their own resources, perhaps not go into it necessarily, but at least uh, be coordinated through such a mechanism. So it's, a, it's, no, it's not a terrible news story. There's more money. Can we use it wisely? I think, can I, I, I I'm just going to come back on that because um, people may not be clear, when we talk about research and development, research is what Brendan's talking about and that's where our, uh, the hundreds of millions have gone and that's where the increase is going. Development is turning that research into a product that could save lives. Uh, we don't do that and that's not on the table at the moment, although I think it's, a, it's something the Health Security Centre may look at in the future or I don't, it's something we should look at, but this isn't a DFAT issue. These seven agencies, DFAT's only one of them. The bulk of the funding's coming from other agencies. It's MRC, it's MRFF, Department of Industry, Department of Defence, Austrade. It, it's, and we don't have a, uh, we could fix this so easily. We, we need a cross-government strategy that says you each have your own remit but you also have in this area, in the global health area, you have some shared remit. Who has which responsibilities? What do you do? And some kind of sequencing, so something can move from one agency to the next. At the moment, one agency funds it, the next agency funds someone else. So it's, it's just organising, having an organising <coughs> principle, a cross-government strategy that says, these are all your respective jobs, this is the overall strategy, this is who does what, and this is how we talk to each other to let things move from fantastic idea, and you describe these products as a product idea, to an actual product. Because patients don't get saved by ideas, they get saved by products. And you need to turn the, that mountain of ideas into something. Blair, is there any hope for a cross-government strategy, so, given that so, um, so let perhaps me start, global start peace is more likely? Let's start in the narrow and then be optimistic in the broad. <laughs> in, in the narrow, one of the features, and, and I'm really glad there's really strong support from uh, the government departments, but the Health Security Initiative, or the Centre for Health Security, um, uh, is made up of agriculture, or as secondments from agriculture, yeah. Department of Health, CSIRO, Ag, uh, ACR, yeah. and NHMRC. So we are trying to draw in all those organisations that yes, Mary and others um, to, to actually have staff in there. And then sitting above that is, you'll get forward, but a classic kind of I, IDC into <laughs> Department of Committee to provide the leadership and direction. So I think that's a good start and a good model, certainly for the health, health security initiative. Mm -hmm. I think there is a valid point and there's, we are seeing, Brendan's already talked about the MRFF, the Medical Research Future Fund, where again, we're seeing there's some of you may be aware there's an international collaboration platform that sits as part, part of that funding. And through that mechanism, we are starting to see broader coordination, broad discussion about the, the overlaps and the elements that we can work, work on together. But I hear you that the product development is another part of that, not, not just the research. So yeah, I, I think there is hope and there's certainly more discussions and more coordination going on. I didn't mention defence either. I, I didn't mention defence as well in that group that we're also talking very closely through that. Your centre will be a lovely hub for Thanks that strategy, me. I think. <laughs> Stephen, did you want to um, jump in with the, the elaborate on the critique that you made? Or? I suppose this is all a, a great ploy so that I can give my <laughs> 10 cents, which is, yes, good. So I think we've agreed there needs to be more R and D, especially D and purposive development, if we're serious about health and health security. But my question is, is DFAT the place to drive uh, research and development and make these big investments? Or should we be looking at something like the uh, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, where we decided this is an area, Australia is strong, this is an area we want to make a long-term investment, and so we're going to set up a specialised agency. And you know, we've been advocating that uh, either join, expand the remit of ACR to give it this medical or, and health R&D, yeah, or think about some other body, because, yeah, with all due respect to DFAT, uh, DFAT is a body of generalists and there's a huge turnover and it's, I've, I've tried to manage research in DFAT and failed. And um, so I'm skeptical. I, I just, I think if you're serious about R&D, you need to set up a specialized body. It's, it's not the place for, not something a general uh, bureaucratic department should be tasked with. So, so maybe to, to respond to that directly. So um, between the, the government, so just going back to the announcement for the Health Security Initiatives um, 2016 June, just, just before the last election, and then when, when the centre was announced in October 2017, we did a lot of consultation, a lot of discussion, a lot of kind of you talked to Stephen and a range of others about the models. Indeed, the ACR model 
uh, in Canada actually incorporates health. So it is sort of a classic example there of, that we, we can look at very closely. Um, there's also, um, we've certainly, and I've been involved before, of um, institutional based, so university based hubs, and that may be what Ian was, was refer, referring to as well. So when we looked at, I guess, each of those models, um, and with the emphasis that, that we, we've got um, for the health initiative in indeed coming across to health systems, and in terms of operationalizing the research and the product development work that we're actually doing, we landed on something that was attached to, not buried within. Um, uh, DFAT. So those, some of you may have seen, that, which Robin um, he heads up, is sitting outside the cafeteria next to the passports office, mm -hmm. is the Centre for Health Security, uh, which houses the condiments. So we've tried to find what I would call, again, a sweet spot of linked, trying to build on and have connections to the other, um, if we bring it on an annual basis, so the Health Security Initiative has about 60 mil per, per year. We spend 500 mil um, in health across a range of mechanisms through the Rethiate program. We're very concerned about trying to get those connections and get those strengths and links between those two. Uh, in the other models I referred to, the hubs and the, the university-based institution, that didn't work very well, to be quite frank. Not saying that's the fault of the institutions uh, or, the, or, or, or the, um, um, uh, the fault of the hubs. That's probably something more about the culture of DFAT. But we looked, at, frankly, at those mechanisms, and that's how we thought the, the best balance um, uh, would, would work. So to assure you, we did look carefully at all those models. Um, and put that advice up to our government. We've got about 10 minutes left to take some questions, so, so I'll throw it back over to the floor now. Um, there's a general, oh, there's a general, sorry, you've been waiting, Mark. Yeah, um, so things have moved on a lot from what I'm saying. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm, I'm just particularly, Brendan, the, you know, the, the scope of the research and development, um, the, you, you touched on operational research, um, and uh, I guess, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with Daru and I can see that there's really good work going in there. I know some of the Bernard staff, I know the World Vision staff and it's a hard place and it's all, you know, it's all going well. But it's, it's the, yeah, in, in the absence of a functional health system outside of Daru, um, that's, that's, that's a real, that's a real problem. And it's easy to say, oh, that's PNG government or that's the health program um, um, problem. But it's actually a very complex kind of multi-country health system thing happening there um, with Australia, PNG and, and Indonesia. And that, that kind of cross-border health system to me is, a, is really an under-researched um, area. So, I mean, for example, I, I think this is ongoing, um, but um, people are getting treatments on both sides of the border with different drugs. Um, and I still think that it's been unable to get the sort of drugs you can use in PNG approved for use in, um, in Queensland. So there, there's some comp really complex kind of uh, issues there that it would be nice, I think, for the scope of R&D to be broadened beyond um, you know, NHMRC land. No, and I, look, I don't disagree with that. And I think the, the broader um, point uh, that I was trying to make before about the the, the change in being able, you know, since the Sandy Holloway Review um, under Kevin Rudd, where research was brought to the fore in the Australian Aid Program in a way that I wasn't aware of it being before, um, you know, that there could start to be a conversation about how research could be not just done in the development context, but a core part of it, a part of a continuum. Um, so there's never, no, no separation. We need to have mechanisms, and we have been talking about a health security mechanism. But conceptually, at least, we don't put um, uh, sort of development practice and research into different baskets. And to some extent, you need to first define research, because I think one of the fears, if you're a development practitioner uh, and you don't have any exposure to research, is, is just what do you mean by that? You know, because it's a very broad remit, and you've just uh, talked about um, one form of research, Mary talked about another, which is discovery-orientated research in a laboratory in Melbourne or in Brisbane or Sydney or Canberra. That's a you know, million miles from the sort of work that, uh, that you just um, spoke about. But actually, there's some principles that underpin that, uh, that, are, that are scholarly, that are rigorous, that are process-driven, that are peer-reviewed, that have you know, some, uh, you know, the, the results are disseminated for the world to see, those sorts of things are truisms for research, no matter what 
um, uh, the, the, the breadth of it. So understanding that it's a very broad, from implementation research, this is research that's, that's directly associated with an implementation, um, something that's been implemented in the field right through to something operational, a bit upstream of that, um, through to the development of the products, perhaps at this stage we're talking a clinical trial or a regional trial, to where the product came from itself and the science that underpinned it. All of that is research and um, we need to keep having a conversation so that becomes a part of a, of a continuum in development so that uh, we're in a self-improving system. It's the only real way uh, we know to be in a strongly self-improving system is to embed research within it. So I'm just going to take the chance to go back and make a comment from Steve and all my team won't let me back into the, biz <laughs> to, to the building. I think I want to push back a bit on that, that DFAT staff are all generalists. Um, we ain't perfect, um, <laughs> but we have actually really outstanding expertise. I could point to St Stephen Williams, our principal sector specialist for health, with actually got a great background in infectious diseases. And, there's, and there's, uh, the centre for, for that very reason is looking for that secondment to bring in the specific expertise that will actually strengthen it. That's why a person from NHMRC, we've got a great person from ACR. So I just want to not let that sit there, that DFAT is made up of just journalists. <laughs> we ain't perfect. And then we've got a question up the back, and then I think we've got another one over here. Um, Great. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mark Redwood. I work at Co-Water and Sojema International. Um, but I spent the first 15 years of my career at IDRC, the Canada's International Development Research Centre, which is uh, sort of Canada's specialised unit for international development-related research. And I think a couple of points, I, just coming back to the gentleman's comment about a specialised unit supporting research, I absolutely think that it is good to have that kind of a structure such as ACIR, and I'm not exactly sure if, you know, how ACIR is linked with DFAT, but uh, in IDRC's case, uh, it was set up by an act of parliament, a separate act, so it was, it's arm's length from government, even though it gets most of its core funding from government. The advantage of that is it allows the, researcher, uh, the researchers to have that in measure of independence from sort of the political waves that, that happen within Global Affairs Canada, but the cost of that is that because it is arm's length, there was no effective mechanism to figure out how Global Affairs Canada can actually use the research that is done by IDRC and supported by IDRC. So I don't know if that's a dilemma that's come up with ACIR. Uh, you know, on one hand, I think it is really important to have that specialized unit, but on the other hand, there needs to be that way of conveying the results so that they end up influencing the kinds of programming that DFAT does, because the, the, the results of the research can be incredibly valuable to improve the quality of development assistance across across the entire you know, Australian government. Yeah, I, I think that's a really nice representation of the trade-offs, if you like, of, of the two models. Um, and I guess we've ended up on one side of that, but I can absolutely agree and see, see the... Um, You're the sort of having a bet each side. way. No, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, which is a good thing. I'm not saying that's a... I'm not criticising. We're, we're getting close to our time, but we'll try and do at least two, and, and then I'm going to get my cut-off signal, I think. So, Helen Ware from the University of New England. I think maybe I've spent too much time in developing countries, but listening, you know, if the oxytocin puffer is really that nearly ready, and the problem is a bureaucratic one of seven departments involved, why doesn't somebody take Lucy Turnbull out to lunch and get her to take the course? Does anyone here know Lucy yeah. Turnbull? Mary's trying. <laughs> We'll take that as a comment. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and over here, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joel Megan from the University of Sydney. We've talked a lot about models uh, of structuring Australian response to health security. I uh, was wondering if there's comments on what we can do with our neighbours in terms of, there was an African CDC developed a couple of years ago, for example. Um, is the centre working with partners in the Pacific or Southeast Asia to look at the right model to support health security in those regions rather than just focus on what we're doing here in Canberra? Uh, absolutely. So um, in two trips that I did last year wearing my, my ambassador hat was to PNG in C Cambodia and that was exactly the framing of the questions we were thinking about partners that we, we can work in both who are already there and operating. Cambodia has a CDC. Um, uh, how, how do we work with those existing partners partners, how do we work to strengthen institutions in the countries themselves? Um, well, later this year, there'll be quite a lot of more work happening through the centre to actually frame, frame that question, but we're 
talking with a whole range of solar networks, um, WHO all the way through to country level, think about how we can get the best um, bang for buck in, in our area, absolutely. I think we're going to have to wind it up there because the clock's just yeah, hit the magic number. Um, could I thank you all very much for your questions and I thank the panel for their um, generosity. <laughs> <laughs>